Hey everybody, welcome to our second history of math lecture. And we're going to talk about the method of false position and the method of double false position. Uh, the method of false position, if we analyze it, is used to solve equations of the form x plus 1 over n times x equal m. So, let's do an example. This is from the book, a quantity and its one-fifth added together become 21. Now, let's see what they're actually saying. A quantity, there's our x, and it's one-fifth, one-fifth x, added together, become 21. So in equation form, this is actually what we're going to be solving. Now let's see how we use the method of false position. First thing we do, Make a guess. And with this method, we're not expecting to guess it correctly. But we make a guess to prime the pump, so to speak. Now, we don't have to do what I'm writing here. This is just a suggestion. We can make any guess, but if we're going to make any guess and we can make any guess, we should make a guess that's a clever choice. A value of x that will eliminate fractions. So x equal 5 or any whole number multiple of 5 would be a darn good choice. Uh, I think I'll pick x equal 5. But the next step Record the result that our guess yields. Okay, let's see. X is five. So we have x times one-fifth x, and that's going to give us 6. It's not going to give us 21, which is what we want. It gives us 6, but that's okay, because we really weren't expecting this guess to be correct. But we had to make a guess just to prime the pump so that we could begin this process. Now the next step, divide the result that we want by 
by the result that we just got. Divide the result that we want by the result that we just got. The result that we wanted was 21. The result that we got was 6. Can we take the result that we got and we divide it by, I'm sorry, we take the result that we wanted, we divide it by the result that we got. And hang on just a minute. I need to clear some. Last step. Multiply this new result. By, oh, how am I going to say this? Multiply this new result by what we first guessed the answer to be. Here's our new result. New result, 21 over 6 what we first guessed the answer to be, we guessed five. Now, I guess we should check it. This is our answer after using the four-step process. Uh, let's just check and make sure. We want x so that when we take one-fifth of x and add it to x, that we get 21. I think that's what it was. Okay, let's try it. X is 21.6, we hope. Hold on a minute. Forgive me, I was sitting on my brains. I wrote down exactly what we were supposed to do, and I didn't do it. Multiply this new result by 5. Okay, this is what our answer is supposed to be, I hope. Now let's just check. Our original equation was x plus one-fifth x equals 21. Let's see if it works. x, that's 105 over 6, plus one-fifth x. 105 over 6, and that's going to be 105 over 6 plus 21 over 6, which equals 126 over 6, which equals 21. And that, that checks. X plus one-fifth x 
equals 21. Now I have some comments to make about this method. And I really want to make those comments right now, but I'm going to hold off and do an example using the method of double false position. And then I'll come back and really unload. The method of double false position, its use is to solve equations of the form ax plus b equals zero. In other words, find the number that we multiply a by so that when we add it to b, we get zero. And here's the algorithm. Here's the double false position process. Make two guesses for the solution and call them G1 and G2 respectively. Uh, next, record the corresponding results and call the first one F1 and the second one F2. Now, our results are this. Our results are what we get when we plug our guesses, G1 and G2, into the left side of the equation. So if we plug in G1, we get A, G1 plus B. If we plug in G2 for X, we get A, G2 plus B. And these are our results, F1 and F2. The results that we get when we plug G1 and G2 in for X. We record these results. We call them F1 and F2. F1 is what we get when we plug G1 into this expression. F2 is what we get when we plug G2 into this expression. Now the next step. Multiply the first result by the second guess, F1 by G2, and subtract from that the second result multiplied by the first guess. And then we take this whole piece of junk and we divide this result, uh, we, we divide this by the first result minus the second result. So we take this mess and divide it by F1 minus F2. Let's solve a problem using double false position. Here we go. An example using the method of double false position. Given the numbers 5 and 7, find the number that we multiply 5 by. So that when we add it to 7, we get 0. Now let's see what they're actually telling us here. Find the number that we multiply 5 by. Okay, so this is x. We're going to multiply 5 by x. And we're going to add it to 7. 5x plus 7, and we're going to get 0. So essentially, we're solving the equation 5x plus 7 equals 0. Okay. Method of double false position. First step, make two guesses. Call them G1 and G2, respectively. Okay. Ah, eh, what the heck. One's an easy number. And I have a 5 here, so what the heck. I'll make G2 equal to 5 
for no good reason other than the fact that I see a 5 here. Okay, next step, record the corresponding results. And we let F1 be 5 times G1 plus 7. So F1 is what we get when we plug in our first guess for X. So that means that F1 is equal to 5 times 1 plus 7. And that's equal to 12. I can write that a little bit better. And let's see. The other result we get when we plug G2 in for X here. Our other result, F2, is equal to 5 times G2 plus 7. So F2 is equal to 5 times G2, which is 5, plus 7, which is 32. Cool. Okay. Multiply the first result by the second guess and subtract the second result. Yeah, multiply the first result by the second guess, and the second result by the first guess, first result, F1, second guess, G2, F1 is 12, G1 is 1. And we're going to subtract, I'll tell you what, I'll put this equals 12 down here. We're going to subtract the second result, that's F2, times the first guess, G1. F2 is 32. And the first guess, Oh, I screwed up. I'll get back to it. And if you're wondering, did I make a mistake? Yes, I did. Second, second result, F2 times the first guess. F2 is 32. The first guess is 1. So that equals 32. Over here, I plugged in the wrong number for G2. First result F1 times the second res uh, the second guess G2, which is 5. So I should have 12 times 5 here. And that's going to give me 60. Okay. So what we have is 60 minus 32. And here's our last step. Divide this by the first result minus the second result. See, first result is 
first result is F1, which is 12. The second result is F2, which is 32. So we're taking what we get in step three, which is 60 minus 32. over 12 minus 32. And when we simplify it, let's see, we get 28 over negative 20, which equals negative 7 fifths. Can we see that? Ah, oh, we sure can. I managed to squeeze it in. Okay. Now, hopefully, uh, any typos that I put in here, I caught. Essentially, this is the equation that we're trying to solve right here. 5x plus 7 equals 0. And our solution, negative 7 fifths. So let's see. 5 times negative 7 fifths plus 7. Well, let's see. What is that? The 5s cancel, so we get negative 7 plus 7 equals 0. Bingo. It worked. Now, let's do a retrospective of this. And uh, forgive me for being bitter, but uh, what we're really doing is we're solving the equation 5x plus 7 equals 0. So we make two guesses, and then we take each of the guesses and plug them into the left side of the equation and call the results F1 and F2. And then we multiply the first result by the second guess, and we subtract the second result multiplied by the first guess. And then we take all of that and divide it by the first result minus the second result. So we take what we get in step three and we divide it by the first result minus the second result. You know, at best, that seems really serendipitous and an awful lot of work to solve the equation 5x plus 7 equals 0. For crying out loud, how stupid could they have been? Hello? 5x plus 7 equals 0. Okay, that means 5x equals negative 7. Divide by 5 and x equals negative 7 fifths. Yep, that's what we got. Using the method of double false position, this is what I get just solving the equation for x. Why do we have to go through all of this serendipitous stuff to get the answer? Well, all we got to do is solve the equation for crying out loud. How smart could they have been anyway? And I've got another bone to pick, too. Yeah, let's do a retrospective about the method of false position, too. Here's the example that we did early. Uh, essentially, we're solving this equation for x. And the problem actually read, uh, find a number 
uh, such that when we add it, it's one fifth to it, we get 21, something like that. Uh, in equation form, uh, this represents the exercise that we were given. And the first step of the method of false position is just make a guess. And we guessed x equal 5 so that we can get rid of the fractions. Second step, record the result that our guess produces. We plugged in 5 for x, and we got x plus 1 equals 6. The next step, divide the result that we want, we're trying to get 21, by the result that we just got, 6. So divide 21 by 6. Then the last step, multiply this new result, 21 6, by what we first guessed the answer to be. We guessed it to be 5. And we get 105 over 6, which, uh, oddly enough, turns out to be the right answer. But, but I got another bone to pick here. This is essentially the problem that we're solving. x plus 1 fifth x equals 21. So why can't we just do this? x plus a fifth x is 6 6 fifths x equals 21. Divide both sides by 6 fifths. And we get 105 over 6. Huh? You know, why can't we just solve the equation for x? Instead of going through all of this cloak and dagger stuff, you know, it kind of makes me wonder, uh, with them going through these steps, whether they really knew what they were doing or whether this was just something that somebody stumbled on and found out that worked. And probably that's really what it was. Uh, double false position and false position, probably just something that... Uh, Somebody just stumbled upon, and oh wow, this gives us the answer. Uh, we make a guess, uh, we take the result it produces, and we take the result we want, divide it by the result we got, and then take this and multiply it by what we first guessed the answer. Wow, it, uh, it really makes me wonder whether they had any idea of why this actually worked, or whether it was just complete and total serendipity. But, it, as far as method of false position, and, let me clear the board. Here's the one we did by false position, and we get 6 fifths x equals 21, which tells us that x is equal to 5 sixths times 21, or x equals 105 over 6. And this thing, for crying out loud, subtract 7 and divide by 5. Really, how hard can that be? For crying out loud, why didn't they just solve the problems that way? And the answer is, the Egyptians had no idea what an equation was. The concept was completely foreign to them. Uh, both of these methods were in use Uh, sometime around 1550 BCE.
they thought of these problems the way they did because they had no idea what an equation was. And it would be about 1,200 years or more before uh, some guy named uh, Diophantus would take the Greek letter iota to equate two quantities. And you know what? The idea didn't catch on. He had the idea. It didn't get legs. Nobody ran with it. The Egyptians were doing this. False position, double false position, 1550 BCE. It would be another 3,000 years, 3,000 years before mathematicians would come up with the idea of an equation. Uh, also, the Egyptians, they didn't know what a variable was. No idea. And think about it. What did I do right here? Uh, essentially, I subtracted negative 7 from both sides of the equation. And then I divided both sides of the equation by 5. If there's no such thing as an equation, then there was also no such thing as equation axioms. It took 3,000 years for mathematicians, some enlightened mathematician, to get the idea of actually putting this symbol in between two quantities that were equal. And then, uh, mathematicians had to figure out that there were axioms that applied to equations. For example, we can multiply or divide both sides of an equation by any non-zero real number, and the equation, uh, the solutions of the equation remain the same. Uh, we can add or subtract any real number from both sides of an equation, and the solutions stay the same. Uh, without an equation, we don't have the equation axioms. So, were the Egyptians really stupid? No. Uh, it took some enlightened individual to come up with the idea of an equation, somebody else to come up with the idea of variables, uh, somebody else to come up with the ideas for symbols for addition, subtraction, uh, multiplication, division, and so forth. Uh, all of these things had to come into place uh, before we could take an equation and solve for the unknown variable x. Uh, the reason the Egyptians solved these equations the way they did is because they didn't know what an equation was. They didn't know what variables were. So they didn't know anything about axioms of equations, and they didn't have any symbols for addition and subtraction, multiplication, division, exponentiation, uh, taking square and cube roots, and so forth and so on. Without all of these tools, uh, no wonder they solved these problems serendipitously. Uh, they didn't have the notation that they needed. Uh, to be able to solve exercises like this in an enlightened fashion. And I'm mentioning all of this because this is going to be a theme that runs constantly through the history of math. And the theme is this. Notation is everything. If we don't have good notation, we're not going to get very far. Uh, on the other hand, uh, someone who's very enlightened and comes up with a good form of notation can propel mathematical sciences uh, to make greater advances in 100 years than it did in the previous 2000. And math history bears that out. Uh, a common theme that runs throughout the history of math, notation is everything.
And this is important to us, not just because we're mathematicians, but because all of us in this class presumably are in this class because we are math teachers. And we're going to have to drive home the point to our students that notation is important. Uh, hey, I was a rebellious teenager. I didn't do things the way I was told. I did things the way I wanted to. And when they criticized me for it or tried to get me to change, I'd just say, hey, that's my style. Uh, well, hey, no wonder I was such a flunky when I was a teenager. I didn't benefit by the wisdom of those who came before me, which, uh, oddly enough, is another theme that is woven throughout the history of math. But remember this. This is a repeating theme in the history of math. Notation is everything. If we have the right notation, uh, we can make advances and leaps and bounds. If we don't have the right notation, uh, we will hit a brick wall, and we will keep hitting that brick wall for 3,000 years and go no further. Notation is everything. And so when we do math, we want to, we want to use good notation, and we want to take advantage of notation that certain enlightened individuals have put in place for us. And we want our students to use good notation. Uh, their progress is going to be and quite heavily on their style of notation and how well they adhere uh, to the recommended styles of notation. Hey, let's not be like the Egyptians. They had no choice. Uh, but 3,000 years later, uh, when the equation came into being and symbols for plus, minus, multiplication, division, exponentiation, taking nth roots, uh, came into place, and the axioms of equations came into place. Uh, seriously, uh, mathematics in general progressed more in the 150 or 200 years after that than it had uh, from the Egyptians right up to that time. So remember this, it's a theme that repeats in math. Notation is everything. It's important that we have good notation, that we find out what good notation is for certain things we're working on and use that notation. And we want to get this over to our students as well.